Many of us have come to live in this part of the country because we wanted to foster that strong relationship in our lives with our environment. And there's probably no time where we do that to such a degree as we do during the summer. And it's not hard to imagine waking up here in the morning and seeing the real purple color you see in the mountains with the, the mist, the wreaths of mist around it, to drive and see cows and green fields. It's not the way it is, folks. That's not what the reality is. I'm here to tell you that there are plagues, miseries, scourges, and even heat rash out there. <laughs> so let's talk about something that I know is on everybody's mind. Tick-borne illnesses are something that's very important to the health of our community. Let's talk about, in the order that we're most familiar with them in this area, Lyme disease is caused by a tick called by various names. It's the black-legged tick, it's Ixodes scapularis. It's also known as the deer tick, more commonly known as the deer tick. It's in the same, all the ticks are in the same family of arthropods, which makes them related to spiders and scorpions. So they're in good company. Now, for those of you who really are attached to the Hudson Valley and feel that maybe I was being a little bit harsh, you're probably right. Because of the 880 varieties of ticks in the world, there's only three of them that cause serious disease in this part of our country, and we're going to talk about those. All ticks are obligate blood feeders, which means that they must have a blood meal every time they want to move on in their lifestyle. So for a tick to cause Lyme disease, they really have to be attached, a deer tick rather, and to cause Lyme disease, have to be attached for at least 24 to 36 hours. And that's a critical factor, and we'll come back and amplify that. After they've been attached to 24 to 36 hours, they are capable of passing the Lyme disease bacteria. And it can take anywhere from three days to three weeks to develop signs of Lyme disease. And when one does develop it, the first stages are what's called early Lyme disease. And that's manifest by headaches, fever, muscle aches, just feeling tired all the time. And more often than not, probably about 80% of the time, a rash. So untreated, 50 to 60 percent of those people will develop arthritis, of the infected people will develop arthritis several months later. Now although the early symptoms, which can develop in three days to three weeks, include joint aches, that's not necessarily arthritis, that's arthralgia. But arthritis can develop several months later and be persistent for years. 15 percent of people will develop neurologic findings. And those include Bell's palsy, you know, where one side of the face is drooping. People go to bed feeling fine the night before, wake up the next morning, and their face is drooping. They can't make their upper eyelids work properly. They can't wrinkle their foreheads. Most often, that will respond to the proper antibiotic therapy, which we will talk about. And then 10% of people who have untreated Lyme disease develop serious heart involvement. The heart can become inflamed. The heart rate uh, can be... Uh, abnormal because of the infection that infects the uh, nervous system of the heart. So these are real serious considerations. It's believed that as high as 25% of people in the Hudson Valley can test positive, will test positive for evidence of having had Lyme disease. The next illness I want to talk about is ehrlichiosis, and that's also caused by the same tick that causes Lyme disease, the deer tick, the black-legged tick, Ixodes. This also only gets passed when an infected tick is attached for 24 to 36 hours minimum. Symptoms don't develop from anywhere until after five to 10 days. So it's a little bit slower to develop. And the way this presents is with a very severe headache, a higher fever than one anticipates with Lyme disease. Also this terrible weakness and feeling ill all over. But then there's some very specific lab test findings. When somebody suspects a case of ehrlichiosis, which is not manifest by that ECM, that early rash, there's blood tests to be done. We do a blood count, and that'll often show a low white blood cell count, a low platelet count, 
and a low red cell count, anemia. There are certain tests that can be done for this and treatment that we can talk about again. Antibiotics for Lyme disease are basic doxycycline taken for three weeks is the way we used to do it. There's current literature that says anywhere from 10 to 14 days may be adequate. Not everybody's switching over to the newer findings. Many people are still treating for 21 days. Same thing for ehrlichiosis. 14 to 21 days of therapy with doxycycline would be the treatment of choice for that. The next is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Rocky Mountain Spotted Disease Fever is not something you're going to encounter here. Just real quickly, it does cause a high fever. It causes a very particular kind of rash, different than the Lyme rash. It causes a rash that begins on the wrists and the ankles, and it's a deep purplish spotty rash that can then spread to cover the whole body. This can be a fatal disease, and it can be quickly fatal. Also treatable by doxycycline. So we're fortunate there's one antibiotic that can cover all of those. And the last disease is babesiosis. Not seen very commonly, but it has been found in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and we know it's going to spread, and it's going to be here. This is caused by a different kind of bacteria. This is a malarial-like disease that causes very high fevers, shaking chills, and it causes destruction of red blood cells. So also a serious illness. Now, to understand why and how to deal with Lyme disease, what we're able to do is talk about the life cycle of ticks. When ticks are first hatched, they're more like an insect because they're six-legged. They're hatched in the summertime, the young, the young larva. And what they must do, they must have a feeding in August. By August, they must have fed on a host animal. Because the larvae are so tiny, they're smaller than the period at the end of a sentence. They typically don't get high enough up to feed on larger animals. They feed on mice. And keep that in mind when I'm talking about mice, because this will come into play a little bit later when we talk about some other aspects of Lyme disease. Once they feed on the mice, those are the ticks that will survive to the following spring. What they do is they burrow into the leaf litter, and they remain there dormant in the leaf litter until the next year, when in May or June, having successfully fed on a blood meal, probably from a white-footed mouse, they now molt, they mature into something called a nymph. And the nymph is about the nymphal larva, nymphal ticks are about the size of a period at the end of a sentence. Once again, the nymph must feed on a blood meal. Because they're a little bit bigger, they get higher up in the forest floor. They get up on like little branches and on shrubbery. And so they often fall off, they still use mice, they often go on deer, and sometimes they go on humans. They're truly problematic when they attach to a human to feed on because they're so hard to see. And if they're infected from their first blood meal, when ticks are born, they're not infected. But after they feed on a blood meal from an infected animal, like a white-footed mouse or a deer, then they can become infected and they can pass that on to you. So what they want to do is they're going to find a blood meal sometime after May or June. And so in early spring is when we see our first flush of cases of nymphal-caused Lyme disease. So they can go on birds, on mice, even on reptiles. I was surprised to read that. They'll go on any vertebrate. It doesn't have to be a mammal, is what I read for the first time in preparing for this. They'll then fall off and mature. In the fall, they'll then molt again. So if they had that blood meal, now they'll molt and they'll become an adult. The adults, because they're bigger, will go higher up into the forest and we're more likely to contact them then. But if they don't contact us, what they really want to do is get on a deer, the uh, white-tailed deer in our communities. And on the white-tailed deer, they mate. The males and females mate on the deer, lay their eggs, and then they die. And then those eggs fall to the ground into the leaf mulch, and in the following spring, or the following summer, I'm sorry, in the following summer, new larvae appear. So a female can lay hundreds and hundreds and thousands of eggs. Any questions? Yes? How many, how, how many cases of Lyme disease did you get so far this summer? I'd ask the health department to tell us. It's a difficult question to answer. We typically in Delaware County haven't had a lot of Lyme disease, but in the last two years it's been noted to be increasing. The health department um, has very strict guidelines on what they consider a confirmed case of Lyme disease. So your doctor might diagnose you with Lyme disease, but it might not fit the criteria. So you have to fit certain criteria. So I would say last year we may have had eight health department confirmed cases, but many people treated for Lyme disease. 
And um, I have been told that that's on the rise. You know, um, I always thought, and maybe doctor, you know, does the climate, does our cold climate keep Lyme disease down here as opposed to Connecticut and Westchester and some of those other places where it's more uh, It used to seem to be the case 15, 20 years ago, we were only seeing it down on Long Island, and then it moved up to Westchester. And I know now that it's off to Green County and Columbia County, and I know... A, a lot of our earlier cases a couple years ago, they seem to have contracted it perhaps in Long Island, like travel to a place where it was more common. But we are seeing people getting Lyme disease, you know, here. What kind of tests are taken, and how accurate are the tests? Good question. The most common test is an ELISA test. It's an antibody test. And that by itself is sort of like a screen. If that comes back positive, and there are multiple markers that they're looking for, then it gets set for, sent for a Western blot. And that Western blot, if a number of those markers are positive, gets reported as positive. If you have a physician diagnosed Lyme disease rash, the rash that Dr. Stutt was talking about, if it's if it's diagnosed as the Lyme disease rash, you don't need the lab test for further proof. That is proof enough at the level of the state, but as you said, not everybody gets the rash. And so the way we practice rash. in the emergency department is, if we see the rash, we frequently don't even order the test. There's no need to. We'll just initiate treatment. Or if there's enough suspicion based on the patient's history, we'll just go ahead and do that. What we have here are two of the most common ticks that uh, affect people in our area. This is up there just for size comparison. That is a match. These are relatively unengorged adult ticks. This is a dog tick with brownish red legs and a brownish colored shield. That's called the scutum, the Latin word for shield. This is a deer tick, an adult female deer tick with black legs, hence the black-legged tick name, and it has a very dark shield. When ticks bite you, when they attach to you, they secrete three different things. An anesthetic agent, so you don't feel them biting you. Their saliva has an anesthetic agent. It has an anticoagulant, so your blood flows more easily, so it doesn't clot off right away. You know, if you just scratched yourself, it would maybe bleed for a tenth of a second, a second, and then it would stop because of the, the coagulant effects of your body. Ticks have an anticoagulant. And the last thing that they have is they secrete a cement through their saliva. So it holds their head in place. So the reason we know these are females is that the scutum, the shield, is small. And this ties into the whole physiology of ticks, the whole life of ticks, because males, this scutum is hard. Males, the scutum covers the whole back. They can't feed long enough. And let's talk about this. When they attach, and they burrow in and they cement themselves in and they've given you the anticoagulant and the anesthetic, after they've fed for 24 to 36 hours, that's why that's a magic number, they start to regurgitate their stomach contents. And it's their stomach contents that have the bacteria. More ticks. Once again, the head of a match. And this is an unengorged, adult female unengorged, and this is an engorged tick. This is a fat, full tick. The yellow area is where the black-legged tick is most dominant. You can't go anywhere in the Northeast and the whole Eastern Coast line and avoid getting ticks. Many of you can probably recognize these from your own experience, but these are the rash of early Lyme disease. The typical appearance is of a bullseye, red center, white, and then a red periphery. Bullseye rash. And this is showing this to be, oh, 70, 66 six centimeters. I've seen some as big as the palm of my hand. And it's possible to see one here and then see multiple on the legs, on the chest, on the arms, in the armpit. It doesn't occur just as a single entity sometimes. Sometimes there are multiple, multiple bullseyes. It has nothing to do with how severe the disease is. It's just some people react differently. Another bullseye, actually a multiple bullseye, because here's a red center, a clearing, a red ring, clearing, and then a bigger red ring. Right here is what we call vesicular. It almost looks like a blister, surrounded by erythema, which is redness. So just another manifestation of that rash. So here's a question. What are some of the remedies that people have here? How do people get their ticks off? They irritate it with, sometimes people put chemicals on it. Sometimes they burn it. Sometimes they try to smother it. 
Don't do it. If you irritate it, what's it going to do? Everybody together, what's the tick going to do? It's going to vomit. So when you do take a tick out, there's one approach that's the best, and there's different, several different ways to do it. So the way that I use in the emergency department and in my home is the narrowest, sharpest pair of tweezers I can find. And the idea is to grab the tick below its body. You don't want to squeeze its stomach. You never want to squeeze its stomach. Grab it as close to the skin as possible. What I do is I press down with the instrument on the skin so that I get as much skin down low. Then I close the tweezers or the clamp on the head. And then with constant non-twisting pressure, I pull the tick out. What happens if you leave the head? Can the head give you Lyme disease? No. It has to be able to regurgitate, and it can't regurgitate if it doesn't have a body. So after you've done this, wash this with soapy water. Alcohol, if you think that's going to be better, but soapy water is good enough. I had some slides that show people throwing the tick into the garbage. I put them in the toilet. I wrap them in toilet paper and put them into the toilet. I don't want them climbing out and reinfesting my household or my dog or my cat or my kids or me. So what if the head stays in? You can try digging out yourself if you have some clean way to do it. If not, come to the doctor, come to the emergency department, let us do it. Coming back to what the health department said, now you've got the tick out, should you save it or should you throw it away? Well, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to identify the tick yourself, that you can recognize the difference between a dog tick, brown legs, brownish body, versus the deer tick that has that tan-looking shield and black legs. The things we really want to know are, was that tick engorged? Was it swollen? Can you tell me definitely, you know, if you come out in this evening and go home and you find you have a tick attached to your wrist, you know it wasn't there this morning because when you were eating, you were looking at your hand. When you were brushing your teeth, you know that there wasn't a tick over here. If you know that tick wasn't there for 24 to 36 hours, you're not going to get Lyme disease. If the tick is not engorged, you're not going to get Lyme disease. If it's not a deer tick, you're not going to get Lyme disease. Things that you can consider without seeking medical help. If you can't identify it and you think the tick may have been engorged or may have been there longer than 24 hours, bring it to your physician or to the health department to send to the state. Ticks are big business. This is actually a little plastic lasso that you put around the tick. Pull it around the tick and you pull it tight around its head and then you lift it out. Here's a little key so you can always have it on your keychain. No matter where you are, you can save people from tick bites. And this is a spoon. You can use it for sugar in the morning and ticks in the afternoon. So what are we going to do about this epidemic of ticks that we have? What you can do around your household in, in the environmental aspect is clear the brush away from your house. Don't leave brush, debris, old leaves around your house. Clean it up. Keep the grass short close to your house. Don't let it grow long. If you have paths that go into the wood, if you take the compost out into the wood, if you walk your dogs into the woods, cut a wide enough path so there aren't ticks hanging on the long grasses and the long weeds that can brush on you. How far can a tick jump? If you're walking on the, in the woods, how far can a tick jump? No more than this desk can jump. They can't. They crawl. So you have to brush against something, either with your legs, an article of your clothing, or let a branch touch your head like I did. They can't jump. Do wear light-colored clothing. The reason for that is so you can see the tick. Tuck in your pants into your socks. When I come in, I wash all my clothes in hot water. I dry my clothes at the highest dry setting. You can treat your indoor pets, the pets that go indoors and outdoors. You can treat them with ticicides. So let's say you found a tick on yourself. You think it might have been there as long as 36 hours because that was the last time you were out of the house working in your rose garden. And when you find it, it's a big, fat deer tick. And you do remove it. What should you do? You should see a medical provider within 72 hours, because if you have a tick, and it's a deer tick, and it's engorged, and it's been attached for 24, 36 hours, you should be treated with doxycycline. It's an antibiotic, 200 milligrams, one dose, and it's almost 100% effective against preventing Lyme disease. And that brings us to our next topic. More than 400 people every year die in the United States because of heat-related illnesses. More people die from heat-related illnesses than if you combined hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards, 
extreme cold weather, lightning, floods. Combine all those, and there's still more people dying from heat exposure every year in this country. It takes the body somewhere between seven to ten days to accommodate to, the, to elevated levels of heat. Now, certainly there are places in the world that are much hotter than 103 degrees on a daily basis. So why is it such a big deal in Kingston if it touches 103, 104 degrees? Because we're not acclimated to it. Now, we define extreme heat as a temperature that's substantially higher, associated with a higher humidity than usual in any given place. And there's a lot to look at here. This is air temperature going up from 85 degrees up to 105 degrees, and humidity going from 0% up to 100% humidity. As the humidity goes up, and as temperature goes up, the two of them together, it's almost a direct relationship. The red is the critical area. This is apparent temperature. This is not the real temperature. So if it's, uh, let's say, a normal summer day, humidity is what, about 65%? And it's 95 degrees. That's the equivalent of being 119 degrees in terms of your exposure. And that's an area of danger. 105 to 129 in apparent heat is a danger period. Extreme danger is when we get here, and that's not unobtainable. All it takes is a temperature of 100 degrees with a humidity, a 75% humidity. And that's not a big deal in the summer. So what are the heat-related illnesses? They're really a continuum. There's no clear cutoff when heat cramps become heat exhaustion becomes heat stroke. Some basic concepts. Your body is always making heat. You have a basal metabolic rate. That's caused by your circulation, it's caused by your thyroid, it's caused by your skin. There's a very intricate relationship between your skin, your brain, your nerves, your blood flow. And it's always being checked. When we're not balancing our heat production and our heat loss, our motors are shut off. We become drastically ill. We can collapse, we can die. If the air temperature is less than your body heat, you're going to radiate heat away from your body. Once the two of them are equal, and, and the way what happens is, as our bodies warm up, the brain sends signals for the blood vessels to open up and pump faster to bring more blood to the surface of the skin. What happens to us is when the body, air temperature and our body temperatures are the same, you can't radiate heat away. Where is it going to go? And what we start to do then is sweat. And when we start to sweat, there's a liquid interface between our bodies and the gaseous environment outside, and we can evaporate if the humidity isn't high. Heat cramps. Heat cramps are cramps. There are cramps in the big muscles, in the abdominal muscles, the back muscles, the arms, and the legs. It usually occurs in healthy, active people who are exerting themselves too much in the hot weather. Manifest by diffuse sweating, they get pale, you get somewhat pale, not, as, not dramatically pale, you get somewhat pale, you can get dizzy. The way to fix that is stop the activity, don't go back to the activity for several hours, replace your fluids, and go to a cool environment. The next level up is heat exhaustion. And this usually occurs after several days of, in, of elevated temperatures. Again, it's often healthy people who are out, active, and about, and generating more heat. Few people die from heat exhaustion. Things to look out for in heat exhaustion are the way people present. They're sweating, they're pale, they're cramping, all the signs of heat cramps, but they, they're very fatigued, they're dizzy, and they may pass out. The next step up is heat stroke. Heat stroke is potentially lethal. It's manifest by all the above, the cramping, the weakness, the pallor, but there's no sweating. Temperatures are often as high as 105 and 106. The basic treatment for all of these, for all of them, is the same. Get somebody to a cool environment. Stop their activity. You give fluids to people with heat cramps and heat exhaustion. You don't give fluids to people who have heat, heat stroke. They should not be drinking. They're going to need hospital care. They're going to need emergency care. They're going to need it as soon as possible. Well, they'll get intravenous fluids. Who's at risk? The young, infants particularly. They have very ineffective sweating. They have increased metabolic activity. 
and they can't fend for themselves. They can't go get a bottle of water. They can't leave the place they are to go to a cooler environment. Leaving kids in cars. What happens is, kids in a car, temperature can go up 10 degrees in 10 minutes and go up 30 degrees in 20 minutes. And if it's 93 degrees out, and that car becomes 115 degrees, that's not survivable for very long. The infirmed, they're taking medications, they have decreased cardiac output, decreased cardiac reserves, their skin isn't uh, as responsive to the blood vessel demands to cool off as well. And then finally the elderly, limited cardiac capability, they have pre-existing illnesses, they may be taking medications. So what do we do to treat this? First of all, it's important to avoid alcohol and caffeine. Alcohol and caffeine act as diuretics, they make you urinate. They decrease your volume, your blood volume. If you have decreased blood volume, you can't pump blood to the skin to exchange heat. Replace your fluids. Replace your fluids prophylactically. Don't wait till you're feeling weak and tired. If you know you're going to be outdoors walking, hiking, playing tennis, or stuck in a hot room like this, take your fluids beforehand. Keep them replenished. Don't give anybody who's in heat stroke, I told you not to give them fluids, don't give them aspirin. Don't give them Tylenol, don't give them Motrin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, Naproxen, any of those drugs. And the reason is, heat stroke causes damage to the kidneys and liver. Tylenol is dangerous to an injured liver. Aspirin and the non-steroidals like Motrin and Ibuprofen are dangerous to the kidneys. Rus toxicodendron. That includes poison ivy, poison zumac, and poison oak. So there's three ways you can get poison ivy. Direct contact by touching it. The other way is indirect. There's also inhalation. That can be very dangerous. People often burn poison ivy branches, burn the thick bushes of it. The smoke from that can be very toxic, get into your lungs and cause an extreme swelling in the lung. And once again, you know, everything we've talked about tonight, the best treatment is really prevention, avoidance. And this is a typical poison ivy plant. Three leaves, let me point something out. Not only is it three leaves, but the middle leaf is always on a longer stem. The leaves of poison ivy are notched. And it grows just about everywhere, except in Martinville and the Southwest. <laughs> Some of the myths about poison ivy. If you had poison ivy on your hand, you know, blisters and everything, and you were to touch me, would I get poison ivy? can't get poison ivy from that. You can only get poison ivy from the oil. Now, if you had fresh poison ivy on your hand, not the blisters yet, but the fresh poison ivy, then you came over and touched my face, then I can get poison ivy from the oil that spread to me. I'd get it less than you had it on your hand, because I'm having less of an exposure. Thank you all very much for your attention.